Welcome to tonight's webinar brought to you by Igenis Healthcare Nutrition. It's my absolute pleasure, as you can see in the corner, we have um, the wonderful Dr. Sarah Myhill with us this evening. Sarah, as many of you I'm sure are aware, is one of the UK's leading chronic fatigue specialists and one of the only, I think it is, um, clinicians out there that actually specialises and focuses in chronic fatigue and as I'm sure so many of you are aware, Sarah's had absolutely mind-blowingly wonderful results with <laughs> so many patients. Um, so tonight, it is my absolute pleasure to have her with me. And what she's going to be doing is taking you through her wonderful new book, Chronic Fatigue, It's Mitochondria, Not Hypochondria, and talking to you all about how um, this works and her clinical approach. And I'm very sorry, my software seems to be doing very strange things. So bear with me a moment whilst I just fiddle around. Um, so yes, I will unleash you all onto Sarah and she will take you through her presentation. And then if you could hold off questions until the end, uh, we'll have a Q&A session, you can fire a few things at Sarah and then anything you need to know that we don't have time to cover, you can email us directly at iGenis and we can um, field the questions and get Sarah to uh, contact you. So I shall leave you with Sarah, I will be in the background but I'll turn off my video and sound so I don't interrupt and enjoy everybody. Over to you okay. Sarah. Thank you very much, that's very kind of you. <laughs> um, um, I came into chronic fatigue syndrome um, because when I started in medicine, whenever it was 30 plus years ago, I was always asking the question why. And it was increasingly clear to me that um, the people I was seeing had, and they weren't psychiatric cases, they weren't psychological, there was, a, there was an obvious physical basis because uh, the people that were coming were um, professional athletes, um, you know, high flown, high powered businessmen, de da de da de da. And so I wasn't in any doubt from the very beginning that it was a physical condition. It just astonished me that so many doctors um, treat it from a, a psychological perspective. So and I made it my business to try and you know, work out the question why. So that's why the book is called It's Mitochondria, Not Hypochondria. I hope you don't find that too insulting. But it's to emphasize the fact that it's a physical illness with, with, with physical problems. Um, the next. Uh, slide. That's just a picture of me on my horse, so um, you get a feel for what I do in my spare time. And I myself put in all the things that I ask my patients to do with respect to diet, sleep, supplements, and that allows me to function to my full potential. And that should be my job as a doctor to put in place all the things that are necessary um, to do such. So, um, this is the overall strategy for treating people with fatigue syndromes. And the point is, is that fatigue is the symptom that protects from our cells. And it is such an important symptom. If we, if we never suffered from fatigue, we'd work all day, all night, all day, all night, and we'd all be dead after two weeks. That's the, the longest anybody has gone without any sleep at all, I think is about 11 days. So um, fatigue protects us from overdoing things. And I think of, of energy as um, money in the bank. And it's a bank account that can't go overdrawn because if you go overdrawn, you're dead. So um, if you start to get low on energy, the brain gives us this symptom of um, fatigue to stop us overspending. So fatigue is a really important part of normal life. And actually, of course, everybody gets fatigued. So fatigue arises when energy demand exceeds energy delivery. And that means we have to look at both sides of the equation. We have to look at how we generate energy in the body. And we have to look at how we spend it. And we spend energy in various ways. An astonishing two thirds of all our energy just goes into basic housekeeping duties, just staying alive. Basic heart, gut, kidney, um, um, digestive function, um, uh, liver function, and so on. We then spend energy mentally and physically. And of course, that's an important part of managing ME because we have to pace activities so that that mental and physical bill isn't too high. But the two biggest holes that I see in the energy bucket, the emotional hole and the immunological hole. 
and in the immunological whole, I'm thinking infection, allergy, and autoimmune response. So, what happens in, in ME and chronic fatigue syndrome is either the pot of energy is small because um, we're not generating it, uh, because of all these factors which I'll go into, or because we're spending the energy wastefully, we're, we're, we're throwing it away. So, let's say this is how we spend the energy. I'm, sometimes I jump ahead of myself, so forgive me for that. But the most astonishing statistic on this slide um, is the liver. As you can see, I mean, the brain, the brain weighs just 2% of body weight, but consumes 19% of all our energy. Heart, 7%. But the liver consumes more energy than the brain and the heart combined, which I have to say, I'm blown away by that statistic. I think it reflects the fact that, um, and, and also reflects a, a recent interest of mine, which is the fermenting gut, which is how much energy is used up by the liver to maintain homeostasis in the body maintain blood sugar levels, to clean up the um, uh, detoxify chemicals that are coming from the fermenting gut, or just, just foods, or whatever, whatever. And then, of course, um, we spend energy mentally and physically, as I've said, um, but the two estate holes are the emotional holes, and, and hypervigilance is a common problem, often disturbs sleep, um, and as I call it, the immunological hole. So, um, the important thing to, to recognize about chronic fatigue or ME is it's not a diagnosis. It's a clinical picture. It's a clinical picture that we recognize as doctors or patients or whatever, and that arises when energy demand chronically outstrips energy delivery. And I think of this as, as the, this the Micawber principle from, from Charles Dickens, where he said, you know, income uh, 20 shillings, outgoing 21 shillings, and it result in misery. Um, uh, income at 20 shillings, outgoing 19 shillings, result happiness. And um, all my ME patients are in uh, negative energy balance. You know, there are cases of you know, probably income, you know, two shillings, um, outgoing four shillings, uh, and result misery. So, diagnosis is all about identifying the underlying causes for that energy deficit because that gives us obvious indications for management. So if you can diagnose poor, it's just poor energy delivery, then you can tackle that. Or if you're wasting energy for whatever reason, you know, then we can tackle that. So the first point is we have to make the energy off as fast as we can. And a very useful analogy, which is, uh, which is very helpful, is to think of the body as a car. And um, if, you, if the body is a car, then to get that car to go, these are all things you need. You need an engine, that's your motor contour. You need the correct fuel in the tank. And that's diet and gut function. You need oxygen there, that's the lungs and the heart and circulation. Of course, anybody who has anemia um, um, is going to have chronic fatigue syndrome because they can't get the oxygen there. Anybody in respiratory failure is going to have chronic fatigue syndrome because they can't get the oxygen there. The thyroid, and, and those are obvious causes of fatigue, which in the medical profession do pick up on. The thyroid gland is the accelerator pedal of your car. Um, so that sets how um, uh, fast the mitochondria go. And again, there's another little interesting wrinkle here, because the thyroid is determined. Uh, uh, the thyroid is responsible for determining the number of mitochondria. So if the thyroid gland is going slow, you don't have many mitochondria. So not only does your engine go slow, but it's a rather small engine as well. So that's a, a, a W there. The adrenal gland is the gearbox of the car, and that allows us to gear up energy. Um, production according to stress. And essentially, we have the immediate stress hormone, which is adrenaline, which allows us to sprint a 100 meters in, in, in faster than a Hussein Bolt when a, a saber tooth tiger leaps out at us. We have um, hydrocortisone, which is the um, medium uh, time, uh, the, the short range, or uh, the medium range uh, stress hormone, which allows us to maintain the, the adrenaline response. And then we have DHA, which is effectively the long term stress response. So um, that allows us to gear very closely um, the stress response to the, um, the time effect. Sleep is so important. Um, sleep is when the body services and heals and repairs. Okay. Your car may just require um, you know, a service once every six months, but our bodies require um, a servicing every night. And the average sleep requirement is eight to nine hours, and it must be good quality sleep. The methylation cycle is part of the toolkit that heals and repairs. Antioxidants, you know, that keeps everything you know, clean and tidy. I mean, you cannot burn sugar in the presence of oxygen without producing nasty toxic substances, and they're called free radicals. 
and um, antioxidants um, and detoxification are essential for mopping up those uh, free radicals. And then, of course, uh, we need the brain in a fit state um, uh, to make the body work. And I think that's the driver of the car. So, of course, that's why CBT and grade exercise doesn't work, because all that does is beat up the driver. And you know, any mechanic that chose to do that with one of his clients um, would rapidly lose um, his clientele, as indeed do the doctors who do the same thing. OK, so let's start with mitochondria, which, as I think of it, are the engines of our car. Of course, they need an adequate supply of fuel and oxygen in order to be able to feed them, because that's what mitochondria do. They burn um, sugar and uh, short chain fatty acids in the presence of oxygen um, to make energy. They, the form of energy they produce is ATP. And ATP is the energy molecule. And I think of ATP as money. And as a molecule of ATP, you can buy any job in the body. You can make a hormone, you can conduct a, a nerve impulse, you can contract a muscle or whatever. And in fact, from an evolutionary perspective, ATP is a very primitive molecule. It goes right back to the first um, steps of, um, of, of, of time and, and, and life. The biochemical steps involve glycolysis, uh, which is the first step in Krebs citric acid cycle which makes um, um, a small amount of ATP. And the second step is oxidative phosphorylation, which makes a lot of ATP. So um, glycolysis is what yeast cells do when they ferment. It's very inefficient. Um, and that happens in anaerobic metabolisms. What makes mammals, well, what makes any animal that has mitochondria um, is so efficient is that they, can, they have this um, uh, biochemical um, powerhouse of mitochondria that um, produce energy with oxidative phosphorylation, which produces 32 molecules of ATP. So it's, it's, it's an incredibly efficient way of getting energy. And um, uh, so an ox the point is oxidative phosphorylation makes the most ATP from one glucose molecule, and that can only happen in mitochondria. So this is the schematic, this is the, 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 the brief thing. So the fuel coming in um, and oxygen um, uh, oxidize the mitochondria to produce ATP, which is the energy molecule. ATP is exported out of mitochondria um, uh, where it's available uh, to release energy, and in doing so, it gets converted to ADP. ATP refers to the number of phosphate groups, so it's adenosine tri, i.e., three phosphates, and in being um, releasing its energy, it gets converted to ADP, and AD ADP, the diphosphate, goes back into the mitochondria. Um, uh, where it's uh, recycled. So, as I say, it's the currency of energy. And the point here is that if ATP production is slow, then cells will waste. And I think this is the central uh, pathophysiological lesion in chronic fatigue syndrome. We have slow production and slow recycling of ATP. And in clinically, that manifests um, physically as poor stamina. So, um, we then have to ask the question, what happens when you stress the symptom? Because this is a feature of my uh, CFS patients. They don't tolerate stress. Now, when so what I mean by stress is that we're asking for energy out of mitochondria faster than mitochondria can supply it. So energy demand is exceeding energy delivery. All the ATP that's there gets converted to ADP very quickly. And so the level of ADP build up. Now, there's a... Um, you know, um, uh, it actually, there is a, a little biochemical trick that can be employed to get a, squeeze a little bit more energy out of the system, which is that ADP gets shunted into AMP, which is the monophosphate. Now, the trouble about that is that AMP cannot be efficiently recycled like, ATP, like ADP can. It's lost to the, symptom, to the system. And what that means is energy supply suddenly shuts down and the sufferer, you know, hits a brick wall, as I call it, and is pulled out. So that... Um, illustrates the first major symptom in chronic fatigue, which is the very poor stamina. In order to recover from that, the body has to make brand new ATP. It can't make it from AMP. Largely speaking, that's lost. It can make, of course, new ATP, but it has to start from scratch. It's not coming from recycled ADP. And it does this from the carbon sugar D-ribose. Now, the business of making D-ribose is a difficult bit of biochemistry. It's difficult bit phosphate shunt. And it's slow. It takes some days. And I think that explains the second 
uh, symptom that characterizes chronic fatigue syndrome, which is delayed fatigue. Uh, in the interim, the body can cheat. It can make tiny amounts of ATP outside mitochondria, and that's anaerobically from glycolysis, but that generates lactic acid, and lactic acid is painful. And muscle pain, heavy feelings in the muscle, the muscle feeling dead is typical of my CFS patients. Um, there is a headache that seems to be peculiar to my CFS patients, um, uh, which isn't caused by allergy. Um, um, it's not caused by the other obvious causes, uh, so like migraine, or, and I think that is lactic acid burn in the brain, um, uh, because the same biochemistry is going to go on in the brain. So this is an overview of what happens, um, um, uh, and, and the point here is that um, uh, if we overdo things, get a lot of AMP, can't be recycled, and uh, we get the delayed fatigue. So, what is about this is this gives us the basis for a test for chronic fatigue syndrome, or rather for mitochondrial function if we're going to be precise. And I've been so fortunate, I've worked very closely with John McLaren Howard for all over 20 years now. Um, he's a, he is just the most fantastic and brilliant biochemist. He worked with his bio lab. And um, I can ask, uh, sort of, I can pose the theories and, and ask the difficult questions. And John has been astonishing um, in the range and variety, uh, and most importantly, the clinical application of tests to answer those difficult biochemical questions. And the tests he uses are all within the scope of, 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 of research biochemistry, but he gives them clinical application, and that's what makes him such uh, a unique biochemist. So this is the um, um, uh, schematic. This is uh, uh, what's going on. Oops, let me go back. Now, and the point here is that the mitochondrial, um, the ATP profile test, this is what it, it measures. It measures levels of coenzyme Q10, very important antioxidant, and electron accept and donor, and an essential part of oxidative phosphorylation. NAD, vitamin B3, is a really important intermediary between peptic acid cycle and oxidative phosphorylation. L-carnitine, I think of that, or acetyl L-carnitine, as the, um, the nozzle that allows fuel to get um, uh, from the fuel tank in, into the engine. Um, he also looked, where I put that um, A there, um, he looks at how efficiently AT, uh, energy can be released from ATP, and that's a magnesium-dependent process. He looks um, B at the efficiency of oxidative phosphorylation, i.e. how well the mitochondria can make um, new ATP from, uh, well, ATP from recycled um, ADP. And C um, measures translocated protein function. So for ATP to get out of mitochondria into the cell where it's needed, there's a special carrier protein to translocate the protein in. The names are a bit confusing. The name refers to the direction in which the translocated protein is looking, not the direction in which ATP is going. So that confuses everybody, including me sometimes. Um, and then he also looks at how efficiently ADP is recycled back into the mitochondria. That's called translocated protein out. And, and again, it, it, uh, the name is determined by the direction in which the translocated protein is looking. So measure all those things gives us a very useful handle on what's going on. Because we can tell if the mitochondria are going slow because they're deficient in something. And the big rate limiting steps are going to be carnitine, vitamin B3, coenzyme Q10, magnesium. There are probably others, but those are the big ones. And how well translocated protein function works. And that can be blocked. And it can be blocked by chemicals in the outside world, such as organic pesticides or organic compounds or heavy metals. It can be blocked from the inside world, such as products of the fermenting gut. Um, uh, ox um, and lactic acid will block it, um, as indeed will aldehyde. So it gives us a very good um, handle on um, how bad the problem is and why it might come to going um, AWOL. This is a dreadful slide, I'm sorry about this, but it just, it just tells a little bit about the biochemistry um, of how to make energy. You don't need to know about it, um, but for those that are interested, there it is. Now, this is interesting because um, these are some of the genetic um, mitochondrial diseases that we, say, we see. Um, um, and uh, they've got various names like you know, Lee disease, Miller syndrome, um, Pearson syndrome, or whatever. And they refer to um, biochemical problems of mitochondrial complex one, two, three, four, five problems. 
The important thing to get from this slide is the symptoms that these people suffer from. And if you look at those symptoms, you know, many of my ME patients have these symptoms. Exercise intolerance, um, not so much wax, muscle wasting, and I'll explain why in a moment. Lactic acid acidosis, uh, cardiomyopathy, um, um, ataxia, confusion, exercise intolerance, metabolic acidosis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So again, it gives us a, a bit of a clinical clue that mitochondria are um, central in fatigue syndrome. So, of course, I've done my usual trick of jumping ahead of the game, but this is what the mitochondrial function test looks at, um, uh, which I'm not going to repeat because I've just said it. So when um, uh, patients have these tests done at Acumen Laboratories, um, these are the sort of pictures we get. This is the ATP study. Um, this is not quite different now, okay. So the top third of this um, chart looks at the level of ATP in the cells. Um, first of all, what is naturally present there, and then in the presence of magnesium. And it gives us a handle on uh, how much ATP is there and how efficiently um, it is released from ATP in order to make ADP. And as you can see here, um, that top result, 1.39, tells us that you know, there's not much ATP there. And um, the lower one, 0.61, tells us that this patient's magnesium deficient. The second part of the test, ADP to ATP conversion efficiency, that tells us how well the mitochondria make um, uh, ATP. And um, um, uh, what John does, he measures the level of ATP, he puts in an inhib inhibitor, and then he removes the inhibitor. So the biochemist amongst you, that's all about changing the pH um, one way or the other to be uh, affected. But what that tells us is how efficiently um, ATP is made from ADP. It should be above 60%. As you can see in this example, it's just 31.1%. Well, hang on, I can point to that, can't I? Um, um, Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Can I interrupt you for a second, Sarah? Is there any way you can move your microphone very slightly closer to your mouth? As some people seem to be struggling to hear you when uh, you turn your head round. <laughs> okay, that should be better. Is that better? Can, can you can I hear me now? Yeah, I, can, I, I think that's a bit clearer, it. yeah. <laughs> yep, yeah, don't worry too much about that. But yes, um, and if you sort of wiggle over the slides, you can scribble on them. I shall let you get back really, to it. I'm really sorry about that. Okay. So, as I say, the, the middle part um, tells us how efficiently a mitochondria can make um, ATP from ADP. And this figure here gives us the result. Um, um, and uh, it should be above 60. And in this case, you know, it's you know, um, only two thirds of what it should be. Uh, and again, by looking at the various ratios um, here, it can tell us, this test tells us uh, to the extent that these active sites are blocked. So we're allowed up to 14% blocking and this patient's got 30% blocking. So that's again, a very poor figure. The third part of the test looks at how efficiently um, ATP gets from mitochondria um, into the cell. Um, it should be between, um, it should be over 35%, and in this case, it's just 20, whoops, let me rub it out, 26.7%. So, so the translocated protein doesn't work, look very well. It doesn't get um, 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 ATP from the mitochondria um, into the um, uh, lumen, of, into the cytosol, and again, you know. Uh, translocated protein, I've actually said those the wrong way around, translocated protein in is the, is the other way around. So translocated protein in takes ATP from the mitochondria um, into the cell and translocated protein out takes it back again. So what, that what this test tells me is that um, this patient's mitochondria are going slow, partly because of magnesium deficiency, largely um, because of blocking. That just uh, says um, what I've just said, so I'm not going to repeat that, but that's the record. Okay, uh, if any one of these processes goes slow, um, uh, then mitochondria will, get, will uh, malfunction, they will go slow. Any one of those processes um, uh, will uh, be a problem, but a combination of those will be even worse. 
So what we what we devised is um, a method of scoring those different things, um, multiply those all up, and that effectively gives us uh, what I call a mitochondrial energy score. It's an objective measure of how efficiently mitochondria um, can recycle e ATP. And uh, the point is, is it, we then went on to study this. Now, this was the first study that um, I published with uh, Dr. Norman Booth from Mansfield at Oxford and um, Dr. John McLaren Howard. Now, this was 71 patients. These were patients that I had really struggled with. They'd all done the basic workup, um, the diet, the supplements, the sleep replacement, all that stuff, and there were still problems. So um, uh, the patient, uh, um, uh, we sat down together and we agreed a clinical score for them. So they said, well, I'm about 30%, I'm about 50%, I'm about 70% or whatever. I then took blood and we sent it to Acumen and John McLaren Howard um, uh, um, uh, did the mitochondrial function test, did the ATP studies, and um, the ATP profiles were then scored by a third party that gave us a mitochondrial energy score. So we then had, or mitochondrial function score, so we then had the clinical level of disability together with the test result. And we um, plotted one graph against the other, and it was published in the um, International Journal of Clinical and Experimental Medicine in January 2009. And that is the um, resume of the paper there. And the most important graph that came out of that paper um, looked at the mitochondrial energy score against uh, what the patient and I um, uh, reckoned was their clinical score. Now the, these here, that was the control group. This is a group of patients that John McLaren Howard did from normal people um, who've been sending um, results to the lab um, on a regular basis. And actually, uh, uh, the, the normal level went up above two. There were some patients above there, but most of them are on that graph. But the most important bit here is there's a very good relationship between the mitochondrial energy score and how those patients uh, uh, rated themselves. So the patients who told me, you know, they were bed bound, house bound, you know, um, uh, really at a very low level, had very, very poor mitochondrial function score. And um, as uh, they rated them a little bit higher, so the mitochondrial function score improved. And there's a very this relationship and, and statistics when you work them out are, are very powerful. This looks at mitochondrial energy score against age and as you can see age is no, is no bar. Um, maybe there's a slight falling off of mitochondrial energy as we get older but um, uh, it makes the point age is not a factor here. So the fatigue is not an age injury. And the reason you know, why this um, test is so helpful is because it's an objective measure of how fatigued the patient is. So all other factors being equal, by which I mean diet, like nutrient status, thyroid regime, I, all those other things being tidied up, um, it's, it's an objective measure, which has been very useful for assessing the degree of disability, monitoring recovery, but most importantly, determining um, management, because this test tells us where the biochemical lesion is and what it is. Is it deficiency? And these are things that come up time and time and time again, and how we correct them, or is it due to blocking, and which could be a box state of phosphorylation or a translocated protein function, um, or both. So that's why it's so helpful clinically. Now, John McLaren, Howard being uh, such um, a, a wonderful biochemist, has then gone on to um, produce other tests to further investigate this. And these are the tests that we often use microspiratory ometry studies, which is a closer look at the business of oxidative phosphorylation, translocated protein studies, and um, I use those uh, tests very regularly because that tells us what it is that's blocking translocated protein, and cardiolipin studies. Now, the point here is that um, um, you know, all biochemical reactions take place on membranes. For those biochemical reactions to happen efficiently, they have to be in just the right three-dimensional shape to, um, um, uh, for those bundles of enzymes to work well. And therefore, the mitochondrial membrane have to have just the correct degree of stiffness. It mustn't be too runny. It mustn't be too stiff to hold those bundles of enzymes in the right three-dimensional configuration. So having poor membrane function um, uh, will mean that the mitochondria can't work at their full potential. That's an example of um, a microspiratory study, and um, 
John measures um, mitochondrial function by looking at oxygen consumption. So he measures the oxygen, and at various points, he adds different cofactors, um, coenzyme Q10, um, uh, magnesium, and the stimulus for the mitochondria to start working is ADP. If ADP flushes into mitochondria, that's the stimulus for them to make more. And so that's the point C is when um, ADP is added, um, and you get a rapid use of oxygen, um, which then tails. That's when ADP, uh, ADP is all being used up, and then it tails off. So that's a, a normal result. But the point is here is that if any of these raw materials are not there, then that will go slow. What we commonly see, and I haven't got an abnormal result, but what we often see, interestingly, is um, a curve that does something like this. Um, as soon as you, it just is actually below and drops off like that. And that seems to be symptomatic of, of uncoupling of oxidative phosphorylation. And what that means is that um, energy production isn't closely matched to energy demand. And that's a very wasteful use of energy because energy has just been generated um, for no good and clear reason. B3, uh, B3 uh, is the raw material to make NAD, and NAD is the um, uh, essential link between glycolysis and oxidative phosphorylation. It's a very important intermediary step. It's a very common weightlifting step. And in fact, um, in the early days when we were trying to test mitochondrial function, initially, John McLaren Howell was measuring um, the activities of the individual complexes, complex one, two, three, four, and five, that were responsible for oxidative phosphorylation. Um, and he measured a few other parameters as well. And we didn't get any good correlation. Interestingly, the one measurement that did correlate very well was the vitamin D3 levels. And, and, and uh, red cell nicotin uh, amide adenine dinucleotide is a good functional test of vitamin D3 status. And you know, those patients who are the most fatigued have the worst levels of vitamin D3 and vice versa. And, it, and guess what? That's a really important part of treatment. This is an example of a um, translocated protein study. Um, uh, so it looks at um, the mitochondrial membranes directly. And John looks at the numbers of mitochondria. And if they're low, if they're low numbers, that often points to uh, hypothyroidism. Where they're stuck together um, and their structure, um, whether uh, there's natural fluorescence there. And, and um, fluorescence there um, often points to a chemical stuck onto um, mitochondrial DNA, typically an antibiotic, but in this case, um, a, a dye. Um, and then he looks at the pH of the membranes. Um, um, and if its pH is low, that means it's acidic. And the commonest cause of that is lactic acid. So when uh, mitochondria goes slow, there's a switch into anaerobic production with the production of, of lactic acid, and that makes it acid. He looks at calcium levels which are often abnormal. Um, there's a huge amount of energy. It's about 40% of all the energy we produce does nothing but maintain uh, the ionic potential across um, uh, membranes. And a lot of energy goes into kicking calcium out of cells and dragging magnesium in. So if energy delivery is impaired, calcium fluxes into cells, and calcium is terribly toxic. So it's an example of one of the many vicious cycles we see in, in, in fatigue syndrome. If you can't generate the energy, all the biochemistry um, uh, goes down downstream. Um, um, this patient had a, a trace of anthracene stuck on. We also had malonyaldehyde. We quite often see aldehydes, um, which are symptomatic of poor antioxidant status or possibly toxic stress. So, that test would give us um, uh, good implications for management. We'd want to get rid of the anthracene, um, probably by iron fed saunering, and we want to improve antioxidant status um, to get rid of the melondehyde. This is an example of a cardiolipin study. This looks at the structure of the mitochondrial membrane. As, as, uh, as we mentioned earlier, um, it has to be just the right consistency uh, to function well. And he looks at um, Mitochondria are really interesting things because from an evolutionary perspective, they're derived from bacteria. So um, uh, at an early stage in evolution, um, the eukaryotic cell, which uh, produced energy through glycolysis uh, and fermentation, linked up with the bacteria that had um, um, could produce energy very efficiently. 
And when the bacteria entered the cell, it became a mitochondria, or we called it a mitochondria. But mitochondria are um, evolutionarily different from um, the cell within which it's contained. And in fact, mitochondria have their own DNA. And interestingly, their membranes are different from cell membranes. Um, they have body lipids in there, which gives them a different quality um, uh, from normal cell membranes. And John looks at the ability of mitochondria to make um, cardiolipin. So this enzyme here, cardiolipin synthase, as you can see, um, is like the ability to make that is, is um, deficient. In order to make cardiolipin synthase, uh, you need the um, mineral manganese. Um, and sometimes the manganese um, can be blocked by other uh, minerals, in particular calcium. In this case, um, that's okay. Um, uh, in this case, this, this patient's um, cardiolipin was blocked by a toxic um, lipid, um, which he reckons is styling. And you do occasionally see that um, a toxic lipid present. Okay. In fact, this refers to the same uh, patient I referred to in the previous slide here, who had malondialdehyde, um, and um, uh, again, that malondialdehyde is been found in conjunction with, with, with dialing. Okay. Intracellular calcium test. this test very often, but John is such a good man, he often does um, extra additional tests uh, for no uh, charge. And this looks at calcium studies. You know, calcium obviously is essential uh, mineral, but within cells it's very toxic. And, uh, and this patient has got very high levels of calcium inside um, the cells, which will be directly toxic to the cell. Because calcium is so toxic, um, it, um, cells have mechanisms within them for mopping it up. Um, uh, and uh, these mechanisms include calmodin, which is a protein that mops up calcium. As you see, that's high normal. Calcium can stack onto ATPase, and again, it's doing a job mopping it up there. And there are other calcium binding proteins as well. So this cell is doing its very best to mitigate the calcium flooding in. But um, it's short-term gain, it's, it's firefighting really, uh, and the bottom line is this cell is poisoned by calcium. It's symptomatic of poor mitochondrial function. Now, another part, I mean, when um, we do these uh, mitochondrial function tests, because there's often so many other abnormalities in association with that, which can be used to help the patient, um, Acumen now includes um, other measures. Cell-free DNA isn't directly a measure of mitochondrial function, it's actually a measure of damage. And the idea here is that all DNA um, in the bloodstream should be packaged up within, within a cell. If there is DNA lying outside the cell, then that's come from damaged tissue. The point here is that a cell-free DNA is a measure of tissue damage. And it's unusual in CFS patients to find normal levels. Um, of that. This you know, um, is an, a, a, a case that just illustrates the point that in chronic fatigue syndrome and in ME, there is real damage. This is physical damage um, um, uh, to cells, which can be measured. So if somebody had acute attack of flu, or was on cancer chemotherapy, or had a major traffic accident, they would have cellular damage and a high cell-free DNA. This is a very high reading. We're allowed up to um, 9.5. Um, um, I think it's DLs per liter and um, uh, micrograms of DNA per liter. Um, it, it's actually actually micrograms of DNA per deciliter. That's a, a little error that we, we made in the early days. So again, this test alone puts chronic fatigue syndrome in the serious pathology group. This is another way of looking uh, for damage. Um, lactate dehydrogenase um, is contained within cells. And if the total LDH is high, um, and this gives an example, then that tells us the cell damage going on. There are actually five different isoenzymes of LDH, and by looking at the combinations, it gives us an idea of uh, where um, that's coming from. So in this patient, they've got high levels of LD2 um, and high levels of LD5, um, and that combination oops, off the bottom there, but that often points to a muscle uh, problem. And of course, muscle damage is very common in my CFS patients because they will do too much and push themselves. So 
These are the common reasons for a high cell free DNA that we see in the chronic fatigue syndrome. The first one, the very common one, is that just the patient isn't pacing. And um, you know, all my patients are, tend to be, you know, workaholic, perfectionist types, don't say no, push themselves to their limit all the time. And they and in, in that event, um, energy um, demand is clearly exceeding energy delivery. And that happens at the expense of cell damage. And this um, emphasizes the point of why pacing is so important because if, if you're pushing yourself so much that you are damaging tissues, as indicated by high cell free DNA, then the immune system is responsible for healing and repair. The immune system is our standing army. And activating the immune system is a dangerous business because it can switch on allergy and it can switch on autoimmunity. So you may well damage yourself in the day by pushing yourself too much. You heal and repair at night, hopefully with a good night's sleep, and that involves the immune system, but um, you risk switching on other immune problems which are much more difficult to switch on. You can get a high cell free DNA because of poor antioxidant status, and we measure all these things routinely. You can also get high cell free DNA, again, if you push yourself and you're, you're switching early into anaerobic metabolism. Um, toxic stress um, from the outside world um, also damages, and of course, uh, infection allergy is also damaging to cells. So lots of possible um, causes, and it helps us to narrow things down. Again, this is part of mitochondrial function tests, uh, is a measure of antioxidant status. Yeah. Um, there are three important um, frontline antioxidants. Uh, the first one John measures is superoxide dismutase. Um, superoxide dismutase is present inside cells, um, and that's this one here. Um, and as you can see, the activity of that is rather low. It's, and that is zinc copper dependent. This one here, manganese sodase, that one is the superoxide dismutase within mitochondria. And as, as I mentioned earlier, mitochondria, from the evolutionary perspective, are different from uh, the cells in which they, uh, they find themselves. And extracellular superoxide dismutase, that's what's outside cells. And, and that's also zinc um, uh, copper dependent. Um, and all those have to be you know, within um, range. This functional test looks at actually what happens in, in, under the microscope at uh, how efficiently um, superoxides are working, superoxide dismutase is working in the presence of stress. These are the gene studies um, um, because you can be deficient in these um, enzymes either because you're lacking the raw materials, so you need zinc copper to make this one, you need magnesium to make this one, or the levels of enzymes can be uh, low because the gene that code for that enzyme is blocked. So in this case, the manganese sodase, 84, that are really rotten result, should be between 125 and 208. And the reason for this is because the gene that codes that enzyme on chromosome 6 is blocked, um, uh, as indicated by this test. Another very, very important um, um, antioxidant is glutathione peroxidase, which is made up of glutathione and selenium. Um, so um, uh, that level of glutathione peroxide, as you can see, is a bit low, and almost certainly because that patient is deficient in glutathione. So obviously we want to supplement glutathione there. It's another test, similar, again, actually a worse result, similar picture, again, appalling antioxidant status. Somebody with levels that low, their chances of recovery without correcting that are minimal. Um, uh, very poor zinc copper, glutathione uh, peroxide, that's inside cells because the, the gene is blocked. Um, um, sometimes we see a polymorphic form of the gene, which means there's more than one form, suggesting that one is uh, not functioning very well. And again, extremely poor extracellular product. So that's a, an abysmal test. Coenzyme Q10, again, I routinely measured that. Um, you know, it's in my chronic fatigue syndrome patients, I only see normal results when they're taking supplements. Almost invariably, it's low. Uh, normal range 0.55 to, to 2. Um, uh, that result is uh, 0 0.4. Yeah. And coenzyme Q10, um, the other name for it is ubiquinone. And the reason it's called ubiquinone is because it's ubiquitously present in all cells of the body. Living cells have to have energy. For that energy, they need mitochondria. And uh, CoQ10 is the most important um, electron acceptor and donator 
within um, um, oxyphosphorylation. So CoQ10 levels are low, you can see they're cheap. Okay. So having looked at some of the deficiencies um, that can result in poor mitochondrial function, we then want to look at um, some of the things that are blocking uh, mitochondria. Um, and these are the other tests that John does. Um, I won't go into some great detail because um, I've realised uh, how much time we got for this, Sophie. We've got an hour, an hour and a half, is it? Um, as long as you need, really, Sarah. If it takes a oh, bit longer than an hour, then it's not, not too, too much of a problem. Great. Some people are still having some sound issues, so if you could just try and shout as loud as possible, don't worry too much. The recording's coming through all right from my end, and we will send that out, okay. but just to help people, if you could just, yeah, shout, <laughs> that would be great. I'll, 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 um, I don't know if I can turn the volume up at all. Mm, uh, is that better? Ah, Better? perfect. Brilliant. Oh. All of a sudden, we can read you loud and clear. <laughs> oh, so, so bad. So a bit, bit useless on the technical side of things. Anyway, um, I'm Not glad we've got some time. Carry uh, on. <laughs> okay. okay. So there are then some very useful tests that we can do to elucidate the nature of the toxic stress. As I say, broadly speaking, things can come from um, uh, the outside world, such as organophosphates, uh, pesticides, such as um, volatile organic compounds and toxic metals, or from the inside world. And we can do, um, we can measure the toxic stress by doing uh, DNA adducts, by doing fat biopsies. Um, these days, I tend to do challenge tests, which are kind of the best, uh, most reliable tests of toxic metals. Uh, I think I've got an example of those tests later. Um, again, looking at energy delivery mechanisms, um, you know, uh, obviously, if somebody's in respiratory failure, you know, or heart failure, or anemia, they will all present with the clinical picture of a chronic fatigue syndrome, and you know, conventional medicine will pick that up. But a really important um, feature of chronic fatigue syndrome is that they're in a low cardiac output state. Now, the heart is very demanding of energy, and for the heart to work, yes, it needs a good blood supply, it needs good delivery of oxygen, it needs good delivery of um, fuel. But in the fatigue syndrome patients I see, they have a low cardiac fat state because of poor mitochondrial function. Um, and what this means is that they can have the raw materials, but if they can't translate that um, uh, into a powerful contraction of the heart, then the heart is going to um, uh, beat weakly. And cardiac symptoms in chronic fatigue syndrome are extremely common because poor energy supply means the muscle can't contract powerfully. In the heart itself, and if the heart is asked to do more work, then there's an early switch into anaerobic metabolism producing lactic acid. Lactic acid is painful um, uh, and it produces chest pain. And this, and this is actually the pain of angina. Angina, due to poor blood supply, is lactic acid burn of the heart. But in the chronic, but normally, um, uh, 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 typical angina patients the mitochondria work okay, and so when the patient stops, the blood supply catches up and they switch back into aerobic metabolism quite quickly. But the trouble with the ME patients is that even when the blood supply is good, they still can't catch up, they still can't clear the lactic acid, and it's very slow to clear. So the pain is much more persistent. So it feels like angina, it is angina, but it doesn't clear with rest. So when they go and see their um, um, cardiologist, the cardiologist will you know, ask about um, exercise, um, chest pain. But because it doesn't clear on rest, he'll say, oh, it's not angina. You know, uh, it is angina. It's, it's, it's a typical angina, if you like. And so they come to me diagnosed with atypical chest pain, which, of course, isn't a diagnosis at all. It's just a symptom. Another problem with poor energy delivery to the heart is it doesn't beat powerfully as a pump, and therefore they have low blood pressure. Um, um, they feel much more comfortable lying down because it's much easier for the heart to pump blood around the body on the flat than when you're standing up or sitting up. And, uh, and when they do stand up or sit up, the blood pressure can drop precipitously. Now, in the short term, the body can compensate by making the, the heart beat faster, but that too is energy demanding, and that's not sustainable, and then their blood pressure crashes and uh, it's called postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Dreadful name, um, but you know, it describes uh, the clinical picture. 
And another problem is poor national have energy supply to the pacemaker, really, not poor blood supply, poor energy supply to the pacemaker. So, um, cardiac dysrhythmias are common. And again, um, um, poor energy supply to the cardiac muscle results in the chest pain. And all those symptoms, of course, worse with exertion. So if you take this combination of the poor mitochondrial function, which applies to every cell in the body, combined with the cardiac output, which compounds that problem because not only have you got poor energy delivery within the cells, but you know, if the output, cardiac output is good, they're not getting very good um, delivery of oxygen and fuel then that explains you know, the multiplicity of symptoms that we see in patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. Now, obviously, that fatigue, you know, anybody with poor energy delivery is going to suffer from um, um, uh, physical fatigue. You know, muscles, there's going to be an early switch into anaerobic metabolism uh, and therefore muscle pain through lactic acid burn. The brain, you know, the weight for weight, the brain requires energy 10 times faster than the body. And um, you know, if you deliver energy poorly to the brain, then the memory is going to be poor, cognitive function poor, problem solving, multitasking, um, all those things are going to, going to go slow. There's also a really interesting facet to this because ATP multitasks, as, as I mentioned earlier, it's a very primitive evolutionary molecule. Um, it's responsible not just for energy, it's also um, uh, adenine is part of DNA. It's also a neurotransmitter. And um, um, uh, well, to be precise, it's a co-transmitter. And what that means is that the other neurotransmitters, like GABA, um, acetylcholine, um, uh, dopamine, and so on, they don't work unless you have a molecule of ATP with them. So if ATP delivery is impaired in the brain, then those molecules won't work efficiently. And guess what? You know, low mood uh, may well result. The eye, again, um, the business of converting a light signal um, in the eye to a signal that um, the brain can read, eye an electrical signal, requires vast amounts of energy. The eye is enormously demanding of energy. It requires energy 10 times faster than the brain, i.e. 100 times faster than the body. So if energy delivery is impaired, then um, the eye can't cope with the information coming in. And it's a feature of my severe MEs and my severe chronic fatigue syndromes, that um, they only feel okay when they're lying down horizontal in a darkened room. They just cannot um, tolerate the light coming into their eye. Uh, many of them are unable to read, cannot watch television, um, can't follow a story, and it's a combination of, of uh, the eye doesn't work well and the brain doesn't work well. The immune system. I think of the immune system as the brain, which isn't contained um, within a box. It's the immune system are all the white cells um, uh, and, and, and the neurohormonal uh, 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 mechanisms that go with that spread throughout the body. It's our standing army. And guess what? Standing armies are greatly demanding of energy and of uh, raw materials. And how do I know that? Because if I give a normal person flu, they develop contribution overnight um, uh, because the immune system is using all that energy in order to get rid of infection. Um, Again, poor temperature regulation is a feature of my chronic fatigue syndrome patients. And the reason for that is that um, if they, I mean, they tend to suffer from cold because their mitochondria go slow and mitochondria generate heat, so they run cold. But if they do get into an environment that's too hot, they can't lose heat. And the reason for that is that the skin is a very large organ. It's the largest organ in the body. Um, to lose heat, you have to pump blood to the skin. And, um, and that allows you to radiate heat. But you know, if the heart doesn't work well, it can't increase its output by 20%, which is about what it requires. Um, it, you can't lose heat, and, um, and therefore uh, uh, it, that makes things very uncomfortable. The liver, of course, as I mentioned earlier, it consumes 27% of total energy consumption, uh, production. It's a massive uh, amount. And if the energy delivery to the liver isn't good, it's not going to be good at managing blood sugar levels, at managing hormone levels, at detoxifying, and so on, and all the jobs that it does to maintain uh, to maintain internal homeostasis. Joints and connective tissue, they have to be healed and repaired by the immune system. Um, uh, the gut, you know, the gut, again, I, I've been researching to try and find a good figure for this. Of course, the, the liver is part of the gut, but if, if energy delivery to the gut isn't good, it's not going to be able to digest foods very well. It's not going to be able to absorb foods very well. And all the raw materials we need 
uh, to function, uh, uh, it just won't be there. Hormone synthesis will be slowed. Kidney function will be slowed. I'm currently collecting um, figures, but it's my clinical um, impression from those that I've got that those people with the worst fatigue often have um, low glomerular filtration rates, i.e. their kids don't work as efficiently as they should. And I think it's probably just simply um, an energy delivery issue. Lots of my patients with um, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome suffer from uh, muscle pain, which is called fibromyalgia. Again, it's not a diagnosis, it's a clinical picture. And we've got to um, ascertain uh, or work out the underlying mechanism of that. And of course, poor mitochondrial function is going to be a major cause of that. And the, the symptoms of lactic acid burn, well, any athlete will be able to tell you that. The muscles are weak, they feel heavy, um, they burn, they're painful, um, uh, and they just don't they just don't work. So sometimes that gives a clue. Um, uh, the Cori cycle, that's a, this is a little um, in a biochemical um, uh, uh, trick. The point here is that if my uh, chronic fatigue syndrome patients uh, move into anaerobic metabolism, you know, which they're doing all the time when they ever do things. It's very inefficient, and they're only generating two molecules of ATP for each molecule of glucose that's being burned. That produces a molecule of lactic acid. But in order to get back from lactic acid to um, glucose or pyruvate, you need six molecules of ATP. I, you need some mitochondria that work really well. Now, if you're an athlete with excellent mitochondrial function and more importantly, and as importantly, lots of them, as soon as you stop exercising, um, you can very quickly generate the energy to shunt the lactic acid back to glucose. But of course, my chronic fatigue patients can't do that because their mitochondria don't work. So the lactic acid burn is very persistent. It doesn't go back in a few minutes. It takes hours to revert, possibly um, sometimes days. Um, and um, that explains the very uh, persistent, I say, lactic acid burn um, that we see in the chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, this is it schematically. Um, and the important um, takeaway message, as the Americans say, is that the business of going from glucose to pyruvate and to lactate only generates two molecules of ATP. But to reverse that in the liver takes six molecules of ATP. So it's a rotten deal from an energy production view. In the short term, it might be essential. I mean, those extra two molecules might make the difference between you escaping that saber-toothed tiger when it attacks you and not. So it's an emergency measure, but my poor fatigue syndrome patients end up in a state of um, uh, chronic lactic um, acidosis. OK, we also see um, in um, a chronic fatigue syndrome muscle damage. And of course, the evidence of that can be high cell-free DNA, which we talked about earlier. Or it can be evidenced by high levels of CPK, which indicates muscle damage. Or it can be evidenced by high levels of lactate dehydrogenase. So um, those tests are helpful in, my, in fibromyalgia. It gives us objective evidence of, of, of muscle damage. And the mechanism of that um, um, can also be magnesium deficiency. Now, magnesium is one of my favorite minerals. Lots of my chronic fatigue syndrome patients love magnesium. Uh, some, some will benefit from oral supplements, some from transdermal, um, some it has to be injected. But the point here is that magnesium is necessary for muscles to relax. So if I contract a muscle, um, largely speaking, that's, um, uh, so if I, uh, I'm not saying, oh, there we go. if I contract a muscle, um, that um, uh, requires calcium, but in order to relax it, that requires magnesium. If you haven't got the magnesium present, then think of muscles as, as sticky muscles. Um, they can't let go, if you like. They can't release from their binding sites. And stretching that muscle will tear it. So you get micro tears in the muscle, which then have to be healed and repaired by the immune system. That involves inflammation, and that's painful. Um, there can be muscle damage because of poor antioxidant status. And um, uh, again, the business of generating energy produces free radicals, which are very damaging. Um, you can't, as I, say, as I was saying earlier, you can't burn sugar in the presence of oxygen without producing some pollution, um, some exhaust fumes. And that has to be mopped up by antioxidants. If you can't mop them up, those free radicals cause damage. And another condition that I'm increasingly recognizing is allergic muscles. And I probably get as many emails back about allergic muscles than any other subject. 
the point here, um, and that's why I put my link to my website so you can read about it in more detail. But the point about um, this is that any part of the body can react allergically. The brain with migraine, the lungs with asthma, the gut with irritable bowel syndrome, the joints with joint pain, and muscles are no different. And um, when muscles react allergically, um, all they can do is go into spasm. And the pain of uh, allergic muscles is extremely severe. It's excruciating. People tell me it's like somebody's um, clapped a couple of electrodes uh, across their muscles, and it's absolute agony. And I think the mechanism of this is it often starts with injury. And you know, we're always, you know, in, as a part of normal life, we get injuries. And um, when you injure yourself, there's bruising. And when you bruise, um, muscles come in direct contact with blood. Now, that's not supposed to happen. The blood's meant to be separated by the blood vessel. So when um, um, the muscles come in contact with blood, there is the potential for them to sensitize to whatever is in the bloodstream at the time, which could be um, food antigens from the gut, or it could be bacterial um, or yeast antigens from the gut. But the point here is, is that the sensitivity is switched on by um, um, the exposures um, and maintained by that. Of course, people understandably say, oh, you know, I've had pain in that muscle ever since I injured it and think it's ongoing injury. Well, it's not. It's actually maintained by allergy. And so often when they sort out what the allergen is by dint of the stone age diet or sorting out the fermenting gut, um, that symptom goes away. And gosh, it's such a relief when it does. The immune system um, isn't just responsible for defense, it's also responsible for healing and repair. And this is a little, a bit of an aside, but it's, it's interesting and clinically very useful. Uh, Dr. William Kaufman was a physician in the States, um, and he published a book in 1949 called The Common Cause of Joint Dysfunction. And what he did, he took 1500, which of course is osteoarthritis. In, um, he then took 1,500 patients and he measured their joint range index. And he did it, it's a very um, systematic um, uh, way. He went through all the joints of the body, measuring to what extent they could move, um, uh, how much flexion they had, uh, uh, and he called it his joint range index. He then put those patients on narcinamide, which is vitamin B3, which we talked about earlier, um, in those sort of doses. Um, big doses, 1,500 milligrams to 4,000 milligrams a day, which is 1.5 to 4 grams. He was insistent they took it little and often, six doses. Um, uh, we can get around that by using the slow release preparation, which makes life a little bit easier now. But the fascinating thing about this is that um, the joint range index improved um, re almost regardless of the cause of the arthritis. So this is a joint range. This is the, I'm sorry about the appalling quality of the slide, but I scanned it in from the book. But these are the various age groups from uh, naught to five and the upper age group of people in their 80s. So uh, didn't matter how old you were, uh, it was effective. And as you can see, um, the joint range index before and this after. And as you can see, in every age group, it improved. But the interesting thing is the older you get, the better the improvement. Um, now, he concluded then that the improvement became, resulted from accelerated healing. He, he then recognized that it wasn't that vitamin B3 was impacting on the cause of the arthritis. Um, those patients were improving because they healed faster. And of course, elderly people are more likely to be deficient in, in vitamin B3 than anything else. And again, this squares very nicely with the mitochondrial stuff because um, the immune system, which is responsible for healing and repair, um, greatly monitoring of energy, and vitamin B3 is a major and common great limiting system. Vitamin B3, really important part of getting well. This is another um, a way to look at um, uh, for toxic um, uh, uh, products is to measure what's stuck onto DNA. Um, John has actually re refined this test even further, so this is uh, even more useful. But here's, um, I mean, of course, DNA should be pristine. There should be nothing stuck onto it. It should be um, you know, the genetic blueprint. And in fact, so precious is DNA that in the business of making proteins, we don't use it directly. You know, DNA is contained within uh, a nuclear membrane to keep it safe. We send in RNA, um, which makes a photocopy of the, of the original copy of DNA, and then the RNA is exported to the rest of the cells for the business of making proteins or whatever. 
So you know, DNA is so precious, it's kept pristine. It's kept uh, pristine by uh, that copying measure. So there should be nothing stuck onto DNA. And in this patient, uh, they've got lindane stuck on, nasty toxic chemical, known carcinogen, known mutagen. Also got nickel stuck on, again, nasty toxic metal, known carcinogen, known mutagen. And if DNA is, if there's something stuck onto DNA, it can't because it can't be read. And that can have a whole host of implications, not just in mitochondria, but in all areas of biochemistry. Um, this is another test that I often do, which is a fat biopsy. It's a very easy test to do. Um, I just stick a needle into the patient's fat, pull the needle out, and contents of fat within the bore of the needle are sufficient for an analysis. And here you can see this patient's got lindane, nasty toxic uh, uh, organochlorine, dichlorobenzene, um, uh, polychlorinated biphenyls, widely used as fire retardants in furnish burning, um, soft furnishing, you know, really shouldn't be used. And this patient's got phthalates as well. So it's a real, uh, it's a nasty old cocktail of chemicals. And if, there's, if those chemicals are present in fat, they can be present in DNA, um, mitochondrial membranes, and so on. The other interesting observation here is that these results in fat are in milligrams per kilogram. If we were measuring these, um, oh, I like drawing, it's quite good fun, isn't it? If these um, chemicals were measured in the bloodstream, they would be in micrograms per kilogram. The point here is that they're present in fat a thousand times higher than in the bloodstream. Now, several important points here. First of all, the brain is largely made of fats. If you've got high concentration in your fat, you've got high concentration in your brain. Not a good idea. The second point is, is that when people start to do detox regimes, and uh, what I would use for this would be um, uh, uh, fire infrared saunering, it heats up the fat, it boils off these chemicals. Now, what I'm intending to do, of course, is boil them off from the superficial um, subcutaneous um, flesh onto the lipid layer on the surface of the skin where they can be washed off. But some will be mobilized into the bloodstream and people can get an acute poison as a result because we're talking about you know, um, a thousand times uh, levels in the fat being a thousand times higher than that in the bloodstream. So we have to go carefully when we're doing detox regimes. Uh, that's another example of the transcade frame, which I think we've already looked at. Uh, this is an amazing technique that John does. It's very, very time consuming and really is um, a research only tool. But um, um, uh, this gives us him a, a way of looking at um, translocator protein, uh, uh, translocator protein, the mitochondrial membranes directly. And what he does is he makes up fluorescein um, marked antibody dyes for specific um, substances. So this um, the green dye will be um, probably for mitochondrial membrane itself and translocator protein. Um, and these toxins. Um, represent calcium, and I can't remember what that is. I think it was nickel and mistake. But what you can see is there's calcium stuck on translocator protein. There's nickel stuck on, you know, and when you think that 80% of translocator protein membrane is made, 80% uh, of mitochondrial membranes is translocator protein, you can see how this would be very damaging um, to the movement of ATP and ADP in and out of mitochondria. Um, I think we talked about that. Um, that's again uh, a similar thing that we saw earlier. Again, it's um, fluorescent um, uh, antibody dyes stuck onto uh, uh, um, uh, looking at the surface of the mitochondria. Um, the magn well, it's not magnification; it's 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 a constructive pitch, but it's the, the detail here is astonishing. But these each of these holes essentially is a translocated protein. It's a hole in the in the mitochondrial membrane that's moving. Um, trans, uh, moving ADP and ATP around. And these white bits um, show um, uh, oxidative damage. So as you can see, the white is abnormal. Um, so this cell membrane or this mitochondrial membrane is severely damaged by, um, anti by peroxidant stress. So it's difficult to see how that mitochondrial membrane would malfunction in the presence of such. The blue dye, which doesn't show very well, is protein leaking around. The red dye, again, which unfortunately doesn't show very well, is calcium leaking into mitochondria. So it's a, it's a real crook deal, that one. OK. Now, the point about um, um, treating my um, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome patients is it's, it's, it's never too late to start. And you also have to remember that um, we, we, as we age, we all develop a chronic fatigue syndrome. 
Um, and all old people you know, have chronic fatigue. Um, and it's because our mitochondria, um, the function of them uh, gradually declines with age and the numbers of them gradually declines with age. And uh, as people get older, they, must, they, don't have, they don't have the muscle bulk of young people, they don't have the same number of cells. And that's simply because if mitochondrial function declines sufficiently, then that cell will commit cell suicide and apoptose. So, um, uh, for, for want of a better word, I've used life force. As, as we're young, when we're born, you know, we have maximal potential, and if we all did the perfect lifestyle, you know, for life, we would end up potentially getting to 120. So the oldest uh, woman recorded, um, uh, Jean Calmont, uh, or, or Jean Calmont, rather, she was a lady living in Paris. She lived to 120. But of course, um, none of us live the perfect, healthy lifestyle, including myself, um, and most people leading an averagely normal um, life lived to the age of, you know, let's call it three score years and ten, it's probably a bit more than that now. People live an unhealthy lifestyle, smoke too much, drink too much, eat rubbish food, don't sleep, uh, die prematurely. But the point is, is that at any stage in life, whether we've been healthy or healthy, if we put in place all the interventions to improve our um, health, diet, sleep, stuff and so on, we parallel the healthy lifestyle and we extend not only the quantity of a life, but the quality of our life. So as I keep saying for my patients, it's never too late to start. Your best is at the end of you. Okay, so um, the overall view here again, you know, make the energy bucket as large as possible. Identify how it's being used and reduce wastage. And okay, I said we've got lots of good questions, but you know, at least we're asking the right questions. Um, again, that's just a review of where we've been. Okay. Um, um, you know, these are some of the you know, more recent ideas which I'm developing um, um, uh, uh, in, 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 latterly since those early papers were published. The immune system is like the brain. I say it's enormously demanding of energy. And there's some lovely work done by um, Caroline Pond and Milton Keynes who asked the question, um, you know, when wild animals are put on weight, where do they put it? Um, she um, uh, she collected her wild animals by cycling to work in Milk and Keynes, and every time she found a roadkill on the road, she would lift it up, put it in the pannier of her bike, and uh, pedal into work to do her research. It's a rather nice image that. Anyway, what she demonstrated is that the first place that extra energy is deposited is round lymph nodes. And this tells us, and of course, you know, the immune system is also based in bone marrow, and that's very fatty. So it tells us that the immune system. Um, is greatly demanding of energy in an intensive form, i.e. Uh, fats and oils. One, um, I say, the immune system um, often punches, as I call it, uh, an immunological hole in our energy bucket. Um, inflammation is a very dangerous thing. If we switch on inflammation at our peril, you know, we, uh, our immune system, as I say, is our standing army. And if it gets its wires crossed for whatever reason, and a major reason of that is vaccination. And I see many of my chronic fatigue patients, their, their chronic fatigue or their ME is triggered um, by vaccination. Um, um, it uh, alerts the immune system inappropriately. Um, um, uh, and switching on autoimmunity you know, uh, is not only wasteful of energy, it's also damaging because it creates damage, which then has to be you know, healed and repaired by the immune system. Another way that the immune system gets its wires crossed is by fighting harmless substances, and we call it allergy. Um, and um, I suspect in, in chronic fatigue, in ME, there's another immunological waste of energy which has to do with microbes, as I think of it as allergy to microbes. Now, um, um, I thought I was going to ask okay. um, so that's the bit about um, uh, infection um, and vaccinations. The immune system gets switched on to fight uh, the offending microbe, whichever that might be, and say in the short term, very desirable. But if the immune system doesn't switch off um, for whatever reason, and you get this ongoing immune activation, which often switches into autoimmunity or allergy, then you get this low-grade inflammation. Now, a lot of people criticize me because um, um, I tend to talk about chronic fatigue syndrome rather than ME. There are two threads to the chronic fatigue syndrome and the story. What is common to all my patients, without exception, is they have chronic fatigue. That's what defines the illness. And that has to do with energy delivery mechanisms and, and the balance between that and expenditure. 
Not all of them have the itis bit, the inflammation, the inflammation bit. The ME bit is um, the chronic fatigue syndrome, i.e. the poor energy, and the chronic inflammation with it. And where there's the chronic inflammation there, then I think we are justified in calling it ME uh, because there's an inflammatory component. So that's where I come from. And the important point about that is the name should give us um, an indication of diagnosis and mechanisms. And in a pure chronic fatigue syndrome, we're looking at energy delivery issues. In the MEs, we're looking at energy deliveries and information, uh, inflammation. Again, some of you may be aware of the work done by Martin Lerner, who's shown that some of the ME patients only respond when they're taking antivirals. I've got patients who only respond um, and recover when they're taking antibiotics because of some chronic uh, bacterial um, uh, drive going on there. And some patients um, only respond when they're taking antifungals. Uh, and those latter two situations most frequently arise um, where there's a fermenting gut issue. Another favorite subject. Again, you know, I'm always asking myself, you know, um, you know, what's the mechanism of going on when um, the immune system malfunctions? Because it's a little bit like our senses. You see, what goes on in the body isn't what's going on in the body. It's what the brain tells us it's going on in the body. And of course, the best example of this is phantom limb syndrome. Um, uh, when people have lost a limb traumatically, the brain doesn't realize it's lost a limb and they continue to um, uh, suffer pain or itching or awkward positioning in that limb when there is actually um, no limb there. And there's a lovely book by uh, Dr. Ramachandran who describes this and, and also goes on to um, um, demonstrate techniques that can be help, used to help those patients. But I think the same is true of the immune system. And I um, think the immune system has a similar map of the body. And you know, I have visions of the immune system you know, sniffing around, um, um, looking at um, uh, you know, what should be there and what um, uh, isn't there. Uh, and what we're trying to do in immunotherapy in chronic fatigue syndrome is remap the immune system so that it responds appropriately. Um, and there are lots of good doctors who experimented lots of different types of immunotherapy to try to do this, things like neutralization, enzyme potentiated desensitization. And I think homeopathy is all about remapping the immune system um, so that it um, responds appropriately. And what characterizes all these techniques is that tiny, tiny, tiny doses of molecules or antigens are being used with very profound effects that can't be explained by conventional um, pharmacology. So um, you know, there's obviously a lot more to learn here, but um, I know that you know, uh, there's been recent um, interest in rituximab for switching off the immune system, but that really is a, a hammer um, uh, to crack a nut. It's, it's a very nasty drug with extremely uh, toxic side effects, one of which, of course, is death. <laughs> the important point about these immunotherapies is they're very subtle, they're low dose, the potential for harm um, is low. Um, so, uh, so what I'm saying is in the ME patients where the immune system um, is activated, they've got what I call bad educated lymphocytes. You know, they're doing the wrong thing. Um, they're constantly in a state of um, overactivity or action um, when they should be at peace. So what we can do is we can either uh, re-educate them, and that's where the immunotherapy comes in. We can kill them, or that's where rituximab. I have to say I'm not a fan of that. I don't don't use that, but you know, it's an interesting um, uh, uh, treatment. Or we can try and reduce the things that they're reacting against, which could be foods in the dark. Um, it could be uh, so the Stone Age dark. It could be microbes, um, viruses, bacteria, molds, parasites. That's where I'm getting interested in the fermenting gut, because the gut has a massive burden of microbes. Or we can shift the level of inflammation in the body in our favor. So vitamin D is anti-inflammatory, vitamin B12 is anti-inflammatory, low-dose naltrexone is anti-inflammatory, improving levels of antioxidants is anti-inflammatory, good quality sleep is anti-inflammatory, and so on. Oh, that's me on my horse again. Um, uh, that's what you can do when you start to get it right. Oh, oh I think it must come to the end of that presentation. Um, okay. So, um, um, I've rabbited on for an hour and a half now, so you must all be dying of boredom. 
Um, but what I've tried to um, uh, uh, demonstrate is the, the underlying mechanisms by which we um, develop these symptoms, because that has obvious implications. We can, we can, I'm sure, say so if we can run another uh, webinar maybe to look at actually how we go about treatment. Yes, definitely. I was going to, to say, I mean, firstly, thank you so much, Sarah. That was fantastic. I mean, from my own personal selfish perspective, having a, a background in pharmacology originally and then um, moving into nutrition science, it's fascinating for me to read um, and listen to all of this that you talk about your book as well. I urge anybody who hasn't bought it yet, please, 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 please buy it because it, it really is a very detailed and thoroughly in-depth cover of what Sarah's gone on about here and then goes into much more depth about how to actually manage and treat and, and self-control the various symptoms and causes that you've already identified here. So for those of you that are thinking, but wait, you haven't told me what to do, it's all in the book. So please, please read it. <laughs> um, I mean, so I, what, 